Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good evening. Yang berbahagia Dr. Zeti Akhtar Aziz, Governor of Central Bank of Malaysia and co-host of the AFI Global Policy Forum 2013, Dr. Alfred Henning, Executive Director, AFI, Mr. Nesto Espanilla, Jr., Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines and Alternate Chairman, distinguished participants, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to join you today at the fifth Global Policy Forum, which has brought together policymakers, industry leaders, and distinguished participants from more than 100 countries across the globe, or more than 80 across the globe to be more precise. On behalf of all Malaysians, let me offer you a very, very warm welcome and congratulate you for a very productive three days after hearing Mr. Henning's speech. I think you have accomplished much over the last three days. So my heartiest congratulations to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, as policy makers and as people, we are stronger when we work together. Seems obvious, doesn't it? The ability to share common challenges, to share ideas, to share experiences can help us make better, more informative decisions. The Global Policy Forum is a testament to the enormous potential that collaboration can unlock. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1932, an American president spoke of restoring the welfare and soundness of a nation by constructing a more inclusive society of building a country and an economy in which no citizen is left out, responding to the devastation wrought about upon American lives by the Great Depression, Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal set out to reduce unemployment, provide welfare for the poor, and restore America's prospects. Eighty years later, as we recover from another global financial crisis, policymakers are once more searching for a new deal. The economic models which powered development during the last century, i.e. the extraction of resources the relentless focus on shareholder value, the growing reach and influence of the financial sector are being recast. It is clear that we must find the foundations for sustainable and inclusive development. What matters now is not just the quantity of economic activity, but the quality of growth and that includes the quality of financial inclusion as well. In the aftermath of the recent financial crisis, waves of economic, financial and structural reform are washing over the world economy. The systems which emerge from this reordering will look rather different to those who went before, and with good reason. Citizens governments and businesses have a right to demand that past mistakes or mistakes of the past will not be revisited. We all want to see healthy, productive and well-regulated financial sectors. We all, we all want businesses to pursue and practice sustainable growth. And we all want economies that offer greater opportunity 
to more people, the masses. It is this latter aim that sits at the heart of today's conference and indeed the Alliance for Financial Inclusion's work. Ladies and gentlemen, the downturn brought the opportunity deficit which had built up over the past century into sharp focus. While standards of living have improved across the world, too many people remain outside the curve, shut off from progress, lacking the means or the opportunity to elevate themselves from their predicament. There is still much to be done to address income inequality, the inequality of wealth and opportunity, and to lift more than 2.5 billion people out of poverty. In emerging economies that have experienced strong growth in a recent decade, these challenges have become more pronounced. The sheer pace of development has exaggerated the contrast between those who have benefited and those who have not. And it is increasingly clear that the pursuit of an inclusive economy stands or extends far beyond the specific problem of poverty. Tackling exclusion also means creating equal opportunity, ensuring those at the margin of society can participate and participate meaningfully in the national economy. Macroeconomic policies need to support the development of a broader based economy that fosters a wider range of economic opportunities. We must provide opportunities for employment, or more specifically, gainful employment. We must commit resources to urban and rural development, improve access to health care, to education and finance, and facilitate wider ownership of businesses. Many economists, and not just in a developing world, share these aims or ambitions. They are the precursors for truly sustainable growth. Of course, no two countries will reach them precisely the same way, but we are all talking about a common destination. Whilst we choose our own path, but we want to reach the same destination. And in agreeing general principles and forming specific policies, it would, we would do well to learn from each other's experiences. Ladies and gentlemen, over the course of this conference, I'm sure policymakers have been absorbed or have absorbed some of the successes in the struggle for a more inclusive global economy. And it is my hope that in turn, Malaysia's journey or Malaysia's development journey may prove equally instructive and useful. Since gaining independence in 1957, we have focused on efficiently managing our natural resources while making strategic investments in physical infrastructure and providing universal primary education and primary health care services. Based on UN estimates, poverty in Malaysia has fallen sharply from 17% in 1990 to 3.8% in 2009, and the figure today is even lower. We have achieved gender parity at all levels of education. In fact, women are doing better than men. <laughs> at the tertiary level, and you will be aghast to know the figure, is 68% women in our public universities. 
and we are on track to achieve most of the Millennium Development Goals in aggregate terms by 2015. In line with the post-2015 Global Development Agenda, the government has reinforced its focus on inclusive social and economic development in the 10th Malaysia Plan, with 30% of development expenditure allocated to the social sector. It is this plan, along with balanced programs of political and economic reform, which represents our development ambitions, premised on a philosophy of promoting balance and equitable growth or growth with equity. The 10th Malaysia Plan prioritizes the 2.4 million most vulnerable households with a particular focus on women, youth, and indigenous communities. Our policies are designed to open up opportunity outside our cities by improving the infrastructure, economy, and quality of life in rural communities addressing rising living costs and continue to fight against hardcore and relative poverty by enabling, amongst others, or other measures to promote small businesses to flourish and, of course, enhancing our human capital component with a strong emphasis on early education. We have also sought to address the non-income dimensions of exclusion by promoting greater gender quality, equality and empowerment. To this end, we have initiatives to increase the participation of women in senior levels in both the public and private sector. Ladies and gentlemen, in development as in a wider economy, I believe the trend is positive, but, but as we have seen over the last five years, the true test, the acid test of a nation's health or economy comes during a crisis. It is easy to make ambitious commitments during the good times, but harder to sustain them when economic or political systems come under real pressure. For Malaysia, we faced such a situation in 1997 when Asia suffered its own financial crisis. In that very difficult period, Malaysia, along with many of our neighbours, saw clearly the need to strengthen the foundations of our economy. The immediate challenges of restoring stability and growth also provided us with the opportunity to resolve and the resolve to advance deep structural reforms. These in turn made us significantly more resilient when a decade later a new financial crisis began bubbling up in the United States. Having taken necessary steps to fortify our economy after the 1997 crisis, we were that much better prepared for 2007. External trade, which remains a key component of our economy, is now balanced with greater domestic consumption with the services sector making a significant and growing contribution to GDP. Our banking system has been consolidated, rationalized and recapitalized to strengthen its resilience. And our bond market is recognized as one of the most developed and dynamic in the region, growing by 57% since 2009. This growth was complemented by the development of more comprehensive financial safety nets, including an effective deposit insurance system. 
We also made significant changes to the role of banks in the intermediation process with a much greater share of retail and small business loans contributing to banks' lending activities. And the capital markets became more efficient in servicing the financing needs of larger corporations. Together, these changes have ushered in a more effective financial system with the fundamental objective of serving the economy and our people better. But while Malaysia has achieved significant progress in terms of access to credit and financial literacy, and of course, I'm reminded that we have been rated as the number one country in terms of credit access for three years running, so that's a feather in the cap for our central bank. There is a great deal more to be done. In particular, we must redouble our efforts to ensure much wider access to financing and much greater financial literacy. Our vision is to equip all Malaysians with an essential understanding of sound financial management. And that's quite important because some people like to live beyond their means. Right, we have to advise them then. Provide them with a means and opportunity to improve their financial position and assuring them of the right to fair treatment as financial consumers. This realization or the realization of this vision requires shared responsibility. Responsibility in terms of the government through appropriate education, development policies by the regulators through facilitative regulatory framework and strong consumer protection standards and by the financial industry through responsible innovation and financial practices and no funny financial products to be sold in this country. I must <laughs> stress that. And by individual consumers through the appropriate exercise of choice and prudent financial management. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Bank Nagara's financial sector blueprint 2011-2020 charts a clear path towards greater financial inclusion in Malaysia. And I am greatly encouraged by the work which is already underway. The intensification of financial education programs, the expansion of mobile and agent banking channels, and the strengthening of legislative framework for consumer credit. In these efforts, we continue to learn valuable lessons from the experiences of other countries. And in turn, we offer our own experiences to help others succeed. On that note, it is heartening to witness the impressive strides that Alliance has made in its rather short history, not just in turning a spotlight on financial inclus inclusion globally, but also galvanizing concrete actions to increase it. And I applaud the efforts and achievements made by all countries present here today to make financial inclusion a reality. And each step towards greater financial inclusion actually means helping millions of people in your own countries. But by sharing the lessons learned along the way, it also brings the prospects of a truly inclusive global economy ever closer. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.